So uh, welcome to Many Muses. First of all, I want to thank Brenda, who thought this whole thing up in the first place. Um, and I want to thank Clara for agreeing to take part in it because it's a bit more complicated than just a, you know, reading and looking into the camera, which is what we sometimes do with uh, Zoom poetry reading. So uh, as a team, we've come along, I think, and uh, hopefully everything will work and nothing will go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so also, I want to thank the League of Canadian Poets who are uh, sponsoring this and um, have been very helpful in uh, <clears throat> giving us little stipends now and then to keep the poetry going. So we're going to be talking about our activities in other arts as well as poetry and how they influence each other and then showing you some examples of our creative work in uh, not only poetry, but in visual arts and photography, in painting, both Brenda and Claire are painters, as you'll see. Uh, Brenda is also does performance and, and movement. I do music. So we got lots of uh, things going on here and hopefully we'll turn it into a coherent hour and a half or so. Um, so we're going to begin uh, by presenting. I'm going to go first and then Claire and then Brenda will take a quick break at that point to go to the washroom or if you have to leave and then we can have an open discussion and you can turn your mics on again. Did you want to say anything else, Brenda? No, it's just we're going to just go right through the three of us and then mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a break and talk. Yeah, I'm just I'm just, you know, repeating exactly what you said. Well, that's good. I like, <laughs> you know, maybe I've achieved clarity for once in my life. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first of all, from my point of view, um, I started writing poetry in high school. I wasn't very good at sports. I wasn't particularly academic at the time because high school bored me silly, but I found some interest and excitement in writing poetry. And then my father was a, a amateur photographer and being a scientist and a zoologist, he mostly took pictures of nature. And so I kind of got into photography because with his example and he gave me better cameras i started out with a kodak brownie like we all did etc so um i used to have my own dark room i used to do my own black and white printing etc cetera, etc cetera. and i looked a lot at the work of other photographers so i kind of took a break from photography until about i guess a decade ago and then i got a better digital camera and, and got back to it and if you are friends of mine on Facebook, you know, I post a lot of photographs and uh, really enjoy the responses I get to people. But more importantly, what's the effect of working in photography for a writer? Well, I think it, the big thing is that it teaches you to, to look and to see. When you're a photographer, you're not just going to wherever you're going. You're also looking around at odd things like shadow patterns and little reflections of light and things in mirrors and uh, things you don't expect to see that are visually striking. So as a photographer, I try to capture some of those. And I think that has influenced my poetry because it's important to pay attention to details in poetry. Um, some of my poetic mentors, not personally, but through reading uh, Gary Snyder, uh, for example, talk about how you can't just say there's a bird in a tree. It makes a difference if it's a blue jay and a birch or a vulture and a dead pine. You know, you've got to have some basic grasp of what you're looking at in nature. And that adds more impact to a poem than to say, I saw a bird in a tree. Okay, well, that's there's how many species of birds and how many species of trees. And I'm not saying you have to be scientifically active, but the important thing is to pay attention, to pay attention visually. And so as a photographer, I try to do that. I try to look for the things that other people maybe walk by. A um, few months ago, I was walking with Pam, who is one of the audience members and another friend of ours through some woods near Coburg. And I turned to the side and I noticed an owl sitting in a branch about maybe 40 feet away. And I'm not saying that, you know, I have better vision than my friends. It's just that I happen to be able to pick it out of all the background and owls, as Clara knows, because she paints them all the time, have pretty good camouflage. They can disappear. So I think photography has taught me to see things more clearly. And I think that's really important as a poet. And then the other art I pursue, and I'm going to 
play an example a little while is uh, sort of experimental guitar playing using effects and backgrounds and things like that. And um, I think that photography and music really, uh, pardon me, poetry and music really go together. And I think they have a very old background, which is, I sort of have this vision that before civilization developed and universities and all those good things, you know, people were pretty much sitting around a fire and maybe doing some dancing and some singing and some chanting, playing a drum if they had one to invoke the gods to produce good harvests and treat them better and, and all those things. Um, so I, I think poetry eventually became separate from those other arts, but I think of it, you know, initially they were all one and I think that's probably true in most cultures around the world. So um, it's important to be attentive to rhythm when you're writing, to the sound of words, to the cadence of words, to the rhythmic patterns. And uh, I think that's how music has influenced my poetry has made me more aware of that um, and more conscious of it. So that's probably enough of me talking. I'm now going to attempt to show you some examples. And I'm going to start with a PowerPoint. Let me get in view. Okay, I hope you can all see that. Can you nod if you can see it? I see nodding. Oh, this is great. All right. So um, these are three short poems that I've set up with photographs beside them in, in PowerPoint. So the first one is called, obviously, Rockstar. This warm round rock, the exact image of one side of Jupiter's minor moon, one circular slice of the universe, from a place we can't see yet. Each like a spark, a star illuminating the red dwarfs, uncertain nebulae and spangled galaxies, or maybe just a rock, but here in my hand, on this shore of a minor planet, it says more. And just a trivia note, the white pattern you see at the bottom of the gray rock is a, an ancient um, sort of plant animal hybrid called the sea lily. And uh, so it dates back to the time when Lake Ontario was part of a, a larger ocean. I picked that up on the beach near where I live in, you know, around Victoria Park and Queen. Okay, next poem. And there's the rocks thanking you for watching. So some of you may recognize this locale. These photographs are all um, from a certain historic site in East Toronto where ancient Toronto buildings, uh, details of them were preserved. And uh, before the uh, demolition folks could take them down. And this is the this sort of Greek theater out there. It's the Gildian, if you're wondering. Parents are pillars. At first, they're all we see. Then the world opens between, around them. Sometimes they fall on us, then block. But they're always there until they're not. Now, columns ourselves, we look up to see we support only sky, clouds, and space. But because of them, we stand. So I know this isn't true of everyone's parents, but, you know, how I perceive mine. And the last one is called Progress. And this first image, uh, there's a lovely couple that lives out here in the beaches uh, who look to be in their 60s and 70s. The woman blows giant bubbles to amuse kids and, and people like me. And the husband flies giant kites, uh, wh which he anchors in the sand so he can stand around and watch them. So these are the bubbles from the bubble lady. When I was small, 
My parents were immaculate edifices. Mom with the superstructure of intricate, intricate dark hair. Dad's pipe, a smokestack towering over me. So hugely, and maybe they had everything I needed on one floor or another. Now that I am larger and look down on both of them, seeing their imperfections with the zoom lens of an angel, I wonder how they could betray me, be so human. Okay, so that's the end of that part. And uh, I don't know why this keeps returning to Brenda. Let me, uh, Brenda's not the speaker here. Anyway, I'm just talking about the view, never mind. So I will bring up the next thing. <laughs> Come on, share a screen. Okay. Uh, this is our. Thank you. 
Okay, and I should mention that um, grew out of an earlier piece I developed uh, with Brenda. When we met, she mentioned to me that she was looking for um, someone to do music that wasn't going to charge a, a whole bunch of money for a performance about a poem of hers, Ink Ocean, which related to oceans and oil spills and environmental damage. Uh, so I developed this thing with lots of looping and uh, what's called delay and, and guitar effects and reverse delay and so on. And then, so this grew out of that as kind of related to it. Uh, thank you, Alana. Eric Clapton out and not bad. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to play one more thing. Um, share sound, optimize for video. So, uh, continuing with our technical issues, um, I'm going to attempt to read two poems related to water over this. One of them is rather sad and based on a real event where um, a homeless guy drowned. And I happened to be walking when they were retrieving him from the water. It's called Washed Up. The other one, a little more cheerful, is inspired by digital photographs by an artist named Judith Davison Palmer. Um, the other members of the Long Dash writing group, of which Clara and Brenda and I are, are, are three, did a long, uh, decade-long collaboration with the studio artists at the Women's Art Association of Canada. Somebody's got their mic on and we're getting a little background noise, so just check that your mic is muted, please. Um, okay, so I will begin this. The background music is pretty quiet. So let's see. Unnoticed here, well alive by most, he passed in full ritual. Sirens, lights beating like frantic hearts, Firefighters, EMS, officers in shades, blue nitrile gloves. The canoe storage guy loaning a big boat hook. His still form gently lifted, blanketed on the gurney, face paused and grave as a carved pharaoh's. The crowd of joggers, mums, and idle walkers traded news. I saw him on the boardwalk an hour ago. I'm sure it's the same man. People said he was in their yard. No one asked who or how he ended here in the small waves at Silver Birch Avenue's foot. Afterwards, a copter poised, sliced vectors in hot, wet air, glass eye fixed on where he was and then wasn't. And then the second poem is called Flowing. That zone, riparian, liminal, where what slithers up the bank from water, what slides down bank to be born away. How memory layers broad planes of past, but not the fine sense tracery where river becomes delta. Veins fan from leaf stem, roots below replicate by dividing branches above. Never only one layer to experience. More intersecting veins, planes, skies, and the downstream flux of vernal, diurnal. You only see what I set for. I look. Water is never still. Look longer, and the leaves keep changing. Look long enough, and I have changed.
Okay, so um, that was my bit. Thank you for watching. And I hope the sound effects weren't too disturbing for those of you who had pets in the room because, you know, cats and dogs can go crazy when they hear experimental guitar in my experience. So um, thanks for your attention. And uh, I have a couple of books to plug. I've written two books in the last 10 years. One is Time Slip, which is from Greenwich Edition. And that's my most recent poetry book, still available on Amazon, et cetera. The other is Higher Teaching. If any of you are beginning university teaching or have a relative or a friend who's becoming a TA or a new teacher, they might find it useful. It's called Higher Teaching, a handbook for new post-secondary faculty. Doesn't that sound fascinating? And it's published by Guernica also and available on Amazon. Okay, well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for being here at this event. And I am a poet and painter. In terms of my process with poetry and painting, um, the, the painting came first. Painting was my first love. Um, really got into painting in high school and also directly from high school went to art school. So I was the most serious to begin with with visual art, but more and more poetry would, crept into my life. And then I started <laughs> getting more serious about the poetry in a way. So. I think I'm still looking to to find find that balance with both because I find that both are incredibly demanding, but complementary as well, because as I'll be sharing, and this is kind of rare, a video of my art with my poetry, which is actually the first time I've done something like this. Um, uh, I think you'll notice certain motifs that come up and color symbolism and all that, and definitely a lot of birds and specifically owls. So. There are things there are things in common with my work, but I do find that um, poetry and painting are very complementary, but entirely two different animals. Um, with painting, I find I can work on something, lose all sense of time, like work on a painting for six hours, whereas sitting down to work on a poem, that's pretty difficult. And and it's like with painting the inspiration and immersion for me at least can be sustained a little bit longer. Um, but I guess that's what I mean. They're different poetry. The inspiration kind of comes and you have to really grab it while you can <laughs> and, and then work on it more in a rational way, editing it and painting. You just can kind of go in and get lost for a long time. So that's been my experience and we'll go ahead. I'll read some poems and share my artwork. Thanks to this video with help from Brenda. <laughs> They are triumphant, dramatic, per pernicious. No color on their incendiary rainbow. A binary of good or ill, fixed as one is born. If benevolent, great beauty, fame, unstoppable success. If unfortunate, death by drowning, evil counsel, witch hunts, suicide. They light up or darken a natal chart echo past lives like that inexplicable shadow on the wall, haunting you in nightmare and impulse, spurring need for excessive freedom after you've been tied to a plank, burnt at the stake. My son conjunct Regulus is working hard to dispel the negative energies, hidden enemies lurking in the fixed stars of the Pleiades. Elf Owl. Tiniest of the owl family, I picture you protected under a fairy's wing, not burrowed inside a tall cactus, hiding from the enemy sun. White eyebrowed, you appear venerable, though your lifespan is a mere three to six years. You subsist on blind snakes, the tasty insides of insects, spiny lizards, and scorpions stingers removed before consumption. The desert wasn't always your home. 10,000 year old bones tell of a time among evergreens when overheating didn't threaten your likeness. Pheasant. By the side of a country road, I find a pheasant, plumage gleaming in the sunstruck afternoon. 
eyes closed like two half shells on a beach. An emerald crown adorns his head. Royal blue and violet paint his cheeks. Cardinal red cloaks his eyes like a mask at Mardi Gras. Burnt sienna flecks of cream color the length of his body. Ochre and yellow oxide tinge his wings. Beside the noble beak, I see the only sign of wreckage. Three fresh drops of blood on the road, cherry red of an artist's palette. How elegant, how fragile, vulnerable and proud, this avian aesthete returned to the source of his kind. And changing pace a little bit with a prose poem, unknowing. After Gwendolyn McEwen, past and future ghosts. Everything is already known, but we proceed as though we know nothing. I've returned to Humewood Park, the park of my childhood, where I once ate stolen cherries on a swing and became convinced I'd be gravely punished. It wasn't worth the succulent ripeness, the wraith-like store owner tapping at the window nightly, demanding recompense. This was my first haunt, the ghost of guilt. Everything is already known, but we proceed as though we know nothing. I've lived long enough to see massive change in the city. The coming of condo land before I knew what a condo was, something fancier than an apartment where you didn't have to pay rent. Like credit cards from the 80s, anything you wanted, holding that magic. Everything is already known, but we proceed as though we know nothing. In the 90s, I took acid in the park, thought I was a crow, then a crone. I picked the lock of my future selves, turning them irrevocably. My future self formidable and solemn, far too much for my 17-year-old psyche. I shunned company after that, became an old soul, everything already known. Reprieve. Bermuda, uh, April 2018. I am in need of radical change, of vocation, residence, body, religion, too. Before departure, I read how people with PTSD often lose or find their faith, switch from a left-hand path to the right. I am waiting strange red balloon ascending into tentative sky. There are aliens everywhere. After a rainstorm, tree frogs beep and blip in the indivisible green. A yellow crowned night heron visits at every breakfast. Like a typical fixed sign, my concrete heels believe I am landlocked until hurricane season. Obstinate ox, demanding lion, tricky arachnid, circle me. I dream in texture now, the rippling blue horizon vanishes through coral reefs. A silky parrotfish flashes turquoise in the undulating lagoon. Dry-tongued, I wake to salt water taste. No dark spirits have followed me here. Note to the queen of the underworld. Dear Persephone, I miss you, but you destroy me. Every autumn, the pull to the underworld is extra strong. Red, orange, yellow maple leaves dance around me, forming a crown. I visit the cemetery often, avoid men with the mark of Hades. Yesterday, a hawk sailed across my window and I know I am moving somewhere else reluctantly. Regards. The girl who loved birds loved to play in pavement cracks, searching for momentary flowers, but she couldn't hide her wings. Others picked on her ruthlessly until she became plucked, bare as chicken flesh before the great boiling cauldron of the world. Elysium. The blue door at the end of the threshold is always there. Once opened, you can never return to the old ground. 
the world, a, st a stranger's hand grasping throat, relaxes its hold, illusory curses from Maya, the travesty of death, rebirth, an equal arm cross to bear, longing for the Elysian fields in the month of the sunflowers. Prayer. Under the abandonment moon, you let go the ideal of him. Give up your highest hope. He is not to return, no. And your circular path through the woods completes the cycle. Peace be to, be to you and to him. May you find your way through the gathering haze. Dream of Xenial. This androgynous being has transcended. Iris behind St. Michael, the rainbow's reflection on her mottled skin. Not quite corporeal as she floats above a lake of fire, wings tending downward a descendant of the Watchers, her kind joining the ranks of an angelic penal colony in the fifth circle of heaven. What would those wings be like to touch? White feathers crumple into charcoal at the slightest brush. Okay, and a, something a bit different, a love poem of sorts, wish fulfillment. You are not a poet and of that my father would approve. There will be no poverty, no competition in words, no character assassination, at least not on the page. But you are creative, therefore live in two worlds. You're a nighthawk who rises at 5 a.m. to work on set overseeing zombies and time travelers. Filmmaker and musician, you mirror my artist self though I've managed for years to sabotage her. I'll tell you what I want, to transform this block artist into bliss, create the setting where we're both allowed to be whole. And uh, changing location um, inspired by seeing an amazing, this poem is inspired by seeing an amazing raven out in British Columbia many years ago. <laughs> It's called Raven Hang Glider, Lillooet, uh, British Columbia. Above the azure waters floats a raven, caught up in a rough confluence of air, never flapping his wings, just letting them rock him back and forth, taking twists and turns. The mountains look on, the salmon pause in their struggle. The raven reaches back to deepest memory, earliest time when Raven made the tides by throwing sand in the face of a guardian elder, and she dropped the tide line forevermore. Nowadays, thought the Raven, flying and trickery require much more effort. The guardians are almost extinct, the voyage from sea post to tree so fatiguing, and he calls upon the wind. Oh, wind, please carry me over the tide that I may rest my wings. And a couple of poems um, about, about the goddess Athena, or, well, to her, I guess you could say. I've written a lot about Persephone, and um, I feel like Athena is more stepping in in my life at, at midlife. So I guess we all go through our, our evolutions. <laughs> Athena Threshold. If I can hold her light, if I can forego the palace of perfection, and wear her armor to let me be free. The snakes will form an undetected shield to traverse the infinite city with laser beam eye and Amazon's flare, the last woman to be ensnared. To Athena, I never felt much connection to you, warrior goddess, until you wrestled me away from Persephone her infinite seasons in hell, your shield and helmet a golden flash in a blur of darkness. I never felt much kinship to you, impervious one. Your love of owls, that was it, 
your armor signifying an invulnerability of sorts, power to set clear boundaries and say no, fend off the overwhelm of others. It was never you, Athena, until I put the armor on, or rather till it grafted itself to me, and I bloomed metallic. And I'll share a couple more with you. One is a one is a scary one, <laughs> and it's called Fright. The swirls at the foot of the bed have returned. I dread the blanket of sleep. Male, always male, they invade my room, masquerading as shadow puppets on the wall with the incoming streetlight. Rabbit-eared and whispering, they congregate in secret burrows. Who to trust, who to believe? A Roman Catholic priest, a couple of witches, my shaman friend who exercises entities. What to do before I sleepwalk again? Prayer, ritual, fumigation, Palo Santo, lesser banishing, bathing in Epsom salts? Then a demon speaks oracularly. Cru cruel she-wolf, bestial bedfellow, this is what happens when you're made inexplicable. The hound licks its infernal wound, fur splayed in all directions. Carve my name on a copper pentacle, this or else be damned. Okay, and I will finish with, with this poem tonight, Crucible. If humans can become angels, witches can be saints anything possible in the cosmic crucible. Joan of Arc danced with fairies, left them garlands by an enchanted tree. Blessed Bartolo Longo, former satanic priest, apostle of the rosary. She tells her previous life to fold its burgundy shroud, let go the old bones, the future, a red sea she must cross. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody. I guess, yeah, we can we can stop the video now. <laughs> thanks. Um, hi, I'm Brenda Clues, a poet painter and video poet who loves to dance. And video uh, for me is where everything can come together. Um, so here's a position piece. Uh, video poetry is a combination of poetry and image in video, in video form across genres, an interspliced cross-disciplinary art. A video poem is a hybrid. The poem inspires the film text as voice subtitles graphics is combined with the cinematic we get a verbal visual cluster, a complex, a nexus, a multiplicity composed of vectors that intersect. The video poem casts moving images of poetry into a film stream in ways that enable it itself to become a visual poem. Um, I, I didn't update this. I generally like to, cre um, I'm self-taught completely, um, so I have anxiety around it, um, but um, I, I prefer to create um, performance pieces composed of um, poetry, image, video, uh, a mask and or a painting or sculpture and dance. So for me, all the components of a piece arise from a singular creative process that finds its expression in multiple approaches, poetic, artistic, filmic, and kinetic to the same subject. Okay, I don't know, maybe that was a bit too dense, but just moving along here. Um, so while I wrote this for Dance of Gold Canvas, um, which was 2011, it generally describes my process so I, I'm going to read it because I, I could just keep talking and go way over time. Um, it's better to have me scripted. 
Um, so a performance piece, hints of the epic, the metamorphosis that life is, age and grace, frivolity and art, pain and laughter, humor and seriousness. In the dance, I speak a poetry whose volume is dimmed to just below audible, a poetry below the threshold. And of this nearly silenced subliminal speaking, it's part of the motion poem, a tantra, dance, the journey of the soul, guttural, the woman crying for help during the tsunami, women in war, survival, a Blakean crawl across the canvas at one point, and I allowed some words to rise, utterances. Buto, not in style, but in parts expression, perhaps, and of strength, empowerment, and the fecund, the buds of spring about to burst, Botticelli's primavera, the rich, earthy tapestries of the natural world, and Zen, laughter at the absurdity of life, and love, love everywhere, enjoyment in the body itself, sensuality, a wit, humor. Dancing with the shadows of the self was intriguing in the editing, as was slipping between colors of a rich Buddhist saffron and the smudging shadows of black and white. Editing itself is a psychic process, shaping a moving poem. How a video poem comes to be is almost surreal, magic in the editing. I enter a state where time doesn't matter and think it almost closest to the dream, the mind's most deeply creative process, where you're exploring something and you're not quite sure what it means or where it's going, but are fascinated, compelled. A dance poem, a one act play, perhaps in this piece, something visionary, in that there is a resolution to the conflict, the paradoxes, in the process of art itself, in the dance of the self, self-conscious, but daring to anyhow, give everything you've got. The dance of the self within Krishna's cosmic dance, the spinning painting of us on the canvas, the dance we all share. All right, and you can see and hear that, yes? Yeah, it's good, I see and hear Okay, it. okay, mute your mics.
Okay, thanks. Um, and I'll show you not painting process, but a video collecting some of my self portraits um, that I did for a self portrait Facebook group um, with some poems about writing about staring at the self. And it's called Mirror Portraits. Let me just get it open here and share screen. And just let me know if you're getting a gray screen. It's good. I can see it. I think of you in shades of dusk and green, stain with imprimatura there, like that, blood oozing from bone, pick claret, cold blood rivering to the heart, pick cobalt. If the body is duffel with mustard seeds, sienna, punctured cadmium yellow yolk, lime wash of lapis, rosewood, black almond shell, copper chromium. Paint, linseed oiled skin, bone edge nose, jugular hollow where the neck grows, bladed locks of sinewy strokes. Palette scumbled, shingling fossil, sand blue, heather, ash rose, derma, a visage of angular, irregular, mob of tawny icebergs, jutting jigsaw. Swallowing light, flesh rises. To keep you away, I splash air, rain, turpentine. Reflections. Sit before a mirror, draw, a face emerges in a struggle for likeness. Cadences, a journey of learning. Glimpses, a mirror, window, photo, fleeting through rooms, streets, buildings. Now, stare unendingly at yourself all day. Linear lines, shapes, pencils, paints, water, terps, brushes. Such a sustained gaze at the self, unbearable. She's somebody else for those hours. She doesn't look like me. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you again. Wonderful um, comments in the chat. Um, let me see here now. Um, so the next video poem I am particularly proud of. Split Mask is a political poem. It is an interlaced, layered, multimedia piece that took three years to complete. It's about dictators and refugees, about the masks we wear, what the torn mask hides and reveals. It is about what I hear on the inside of the mask. It was published in the inaugural issue of Crossbridge, an international journal of multidisciplinary and progressive research. Dr. Robert Kane wrote, your creative and artistic video is layered with powerful and thought-provoking messages that truly give your viewers much to contemplate regarding an array of global issues. Again, thank you for your accomplished work. 
me just open the video and then share screen one. Split mask. She peers out. Or you peer in. What is within obscured? When we can't read each other, luring or repelling. The crack in the mask, a scarred wound over a pulsing interior, an abyss, cradle of life, dance of death, gold flakes rising, visor of white, jagged tear, face in shadow. Who is hiding? The mask reveals who I am. Two, hang it on a skeleton of art, wrapped in a cowl of yellow lace, lopsided dangles, ligaments torn, tied with twist ties. Its post shoots up the coccyx like a steel epidural. Bony skull of yellowed resin, dark eye sockets watch. What peers out the split mask? The mask is cracked because my face, my face hidden in the slit veneer, my other face hangs torn, ripped from the skeleton. I cut it open and seal it shut. The eyes are lopsided. Four eyes look at you. Three. When the leader started gassing his people, burning the lungs of babies, tearing the eyes of prisoners out, electrocuting the dying, she wore the mask on fissured streets in combat gear. She was held together with masking tape and cotton wadding. Her spine rusted metal, like an egg breaking, the shelled moon mask. Bone lady floating in the conflagration, news blackout zone. They thought she was sexy in her split white mask. For they didn't see the ghost she was becoming. Through the nightmares of their sleep, she hunts the torturers. Five, silent screams, ravaged cities, millions flee civil war. Refugee camps overflow, shredded families, mutilated, dysentery, rape, arguments, open sores, and hunger. Children scatter, hide, playing games of the war-torn. This detritus of living. Six, love is a masked shadow, whispering in lonely nights. The gold stars, ragged tents, shanty lean-tos, huts, clouds, cold craters of bombs. The moon is a cracked stone egg. Our own faces peer out at us. Seven, focus on where we are torn apart. Eight, when I wear the mask, I inhabit negative space, the emptiness between things, shadow of what is invisible. On the underside, the displaced fill the mask. You can hear them. A mold of bones, the hanging skeleton, 
I fill in the tendons and muscles and skin with torn bits, broken eggshell, string, rags, oily feathers, soft fish spines, plastic bags, an apparition floating in the dirty wind, in the subtext, subhuman surgery. Nine. The mask, a paper image burning. Take off the mask. And the mask underneath. So I'm going to perform a piece, and this, uh, of course, will be my final piece. Um, so let's, I hope this works. Unfurl flowerings. Um, just give me a minute here. Unfurl flowering. Imagine unfurling from earth in spring, a flower opening. Flora, Chloris, Cordelia, a lush panoply, goddesses of flowers. A visor of green ribbons and pearls bouquet blossoming from corset, twirling hoop skirt, sunflowers for Ukraine, poppies from Afghanistan, daisies, dahlias, hydrangeas, peonies white as vernix, floating darkly on a seashell, zephyr winds wine. Venus in florals, a Rembrandt posy, corsage blooming from breath, sensuality of a Fragonard painting budding over nape. Oh, it's me in silk stockings and long black fishnet gloves. And I am no goddess. But imagine inflorescent woodland trails. A flower is an orgasm. Oh, sweetly court, oh, sweet courtly love, why pull me to you? Aging Bella in dress up, wound with ivy dropping petals as I go. Breathe in gardens, meadows, let scent suffuse. Apotheosize flora and fauna, color and fragrance. Encroaching, uh, encroaching floods, wildfires, drought, heat waves, plants and animals dying, glacier waters rising. A rising ocean of plastic flowers in your wild inner gardens. Dance, multi-floral antennae beaming the world. Bees hum, humming. Thank you. So that's it, folks. <laughs> so you can unmute and finish the show. <laughs> Wonderful, Brenda. <laughs> well, it's a 
bit small space and a bit busy to be yeah. doing this here, but. Yeah, but you didn't anyway. like trip and fall through the curtain or anything. It went quite well. Oh, just about <laughs> everything else went wrong tonight, but no, I didn't no. trip. <laughs> Yeah, I want to thank all of you for bearing with us through these technical problems, but we're trying to, you know, as you can see, put a lot of media into a Zoom presentation and sometimes it works and sometimes you got to start again. So, um, thank you, Brenda. And if anyone wants to, at this point, comment, you know, or, or say something, just turn your mics on and, and go for it. Yeah, we're. We're discussing, op well, the floor is open now. So. Well, I just wanna thank everyone for being here and for all of your comments. You know, it's, you know how it is. I'm, everyone here is, is creative that I know and it's always good to get that feedback, you know? So thanks to everyone and your, your, your comments and chat. Yeah, I agree with that, I, especially because of the pandemic, we've all been through it. A lot of the time I feel like, you know, some slightly crazy artistic type in his little garret room, not connecting with other people. So to be able to do this and, you know, see your reactions is very gratifying. Oh, and I know there was a, a question earlier in the chat to answer because uh, Valerie, you were asking what, me, what I work in, what medium for painting, and it's usually acrylic. So 90% of the time acrylic, some oil, but acrylic is a little bit easier to work with, but high quality acrylics that are like oil because so, <laughs> color is important and pigment. So not the cheap stuff. <laughs> what about you, Brenda? Are your paintings also mostly acrylics or are you also working in oh, watercolor? No, no, mine are mostly oil. Oh. I love charcoal. I really like pencil and I, you know, um, I learned acrylic when I was um, doing a degree in fine arts, um, but I never liked it. So I'm still learning oils, but oils are my preference because you know, they just smell so nice. They're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're so edible. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to say or ask something? Well, just to, I just found the evening really breathtaking, like, um, because I know um, your poetry, each of you more, and Claire, I know some of your paintings, but to see the poems with the paint, like, to hear the poems and see the paint, it was really, really moving, and um, yeah, just incredible and I didn't know your I haven't heard your music John so I really enjoyed that piece um where you were were you sitting at water or was that a photo of water that you were in front of somehow I was actually sitting at a dock I spent a I spent June in Nova Scotia uh, at my niece's farm while she was away and that uh, just down the road is the Avon River, which flows into um, a much larger uh, gulf known for its giant tides, the Bay of Fundy, right? Mm -hmm. So I was sitting on the dock and what you were seeing was the river at high tide. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine, you know, you saw how close the water was to the dock. At low tide, it's just red tidal flats with a few streams going through it. So it was a really interesting place to play music and there's no one else around. So no one could say, hey, turn down that guitar. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was a really wonderful setting for that music. Oh, yeah. I yeah. love I it's love really that good. video. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved seeing your dance, Brenda. I really, I really found it so fabulous. And the shadows and the um, sometimes black and white and then other yeah. colors. And yeah. Thank the you. whole thing was really inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. That first video made me think, of, I mean, Billy Idol, not the greatest musician, but he has a song mm -hmm. called Dancing With Myself. And when you started to multiply, so it looked like you, there was a shadow <laughs> and there was another multiply. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually had just finished sewing that canvas 
because I had them up on my apartment um, as to cover the windows when I first moved in because I didn't know what I wanted to do on the windows. And I put them up. I put them up in my living room and my son and his girlfriend just went to bed and I just grabbed the camera and put a tripod and started dancing and I had no music. I just danced mm. and I found the music later. Mm. So where's Clara? That's a synchronicity of the universe <laughs> because I, I was clearly dancing to Arnold's piece without even knowing it existed at that point. <laughs> Brenda, you said you were going to tell us why you were wearing the corset. Oh, it's because of, oh, because I wanted to do, I created this costume and I wanted a, a way to put the flowers and I couldn't think of anything else other than a cheap Amazon corset. <laughs> <laughs> so I was dressed so that I could, you know, mm -hmm. do my unfurl flowering outfit. It's kind <laughs> of a, a bosom bouquet. <laughs> but isn't it hard to dance in a, in a corset? Well, not not this one doesn't have steel oh. or anything. It's just it's Chinese plastic. <laughs> and it's like satin. It's actually very comfortable. It's just a bit hard to get on with all the patches. Right. But no, it, it's um it's quite comfortable actually. Huh. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. <laughs> That's wild. So yes, I guess I should <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, it's just so wonderful you all came. I'm so delighted, and everybody got such. Uh, well, there's the chat was wonderful, and thank you for comments on my pieces. I really appreciate that, and yeah, I think John and Clara were magnificent. So I'm very honored to be um, featured along with both of them. Well, I, you know, you, you do so many arts, Brenda. You're really the Renaissance woman, and your ability to video them and edit them and make these amazing things is, like, beyond me. So I'm happy to be part um, of it. You know me. how I learned video. I sat, I printed out the manual, all 1,200 pages. <laughs> oh, wow. And it was 2008. I was laid off, and I was on EI. And every morning, with my morning coffee, I read that manual. Oh, and I read, oh. and so I pretty much, you know, um, that's how I learned. Uh, I think so, you got your yeah, video sort of driven. It was, I was driven somehow because I knew mm -hmm. that if I could learn how to do this, mm -hmm. it just could be really fun. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Uh, this has been a wonderful evening. Despite mm -hmm. the technical problems, we still saw a lot of good art and poetry and discussion, I think. So if anyone else wants to contribute, do so now, or I'll turn off the recording and- Oh, we'll one, give you one, a good note. one quick question for Brenda. You said you were self-taught and is that your art or your dance or both? Well, when I went to art school, it was the height of conceptualism and we could not do figurative painting. If you wanted to do that, you did that at home secretly. I mean, my painting teacher for three years, he used to make room um, rooms of white sheets okay. and canvases that were um, like a mud brown, let's say it nicely, <laughs> huge canvases. So it, it was the height of the disappearance of the artist, the rise of the critic, the minimalist art that the critic right. could wax eloquent on. So in that sense, yes, I've had to learn anatomy myself and I've had to, um, you know, yeah. I see. Yeah, I mean, that degree was great because I focused mostly on art history. So that was really nice. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to say what a powerful evening it was, mm -hmm. a wonderful evening. And uh, starting with John, your your work on in all genres was 
was magnificent and so enjoyable and set the tone. And um, I was completely pulled in and then deeper by Clara, which her work also has the mystical spiritual feel. Mm -hmm. And then by the time it came to you, Brenda, I almost felt in a hypnotic state. Good. And with your <laughs> move, you, I could Clara. not take my eyes off you. I couldn't take my eyes off you. I was so sad when there was the technical difficulty. It, and uh, of course, the poetry that went just elevated, elevated, elevated all the um, art of, of different genres you had for us. And so by the end, I feel as an as an audience member, quite exhausted. It was such a <laughs> such an emotional and uh, engaging experience. I really felt yeah. there with all three of you. You did a outstanding job, everyone. So much talent and so much wonderful work. Thank you so much for a really thank special you, evening. Yes, thank, thank you. you Merle. Thank I think you. it was that definitely was so... the right order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yep. great. I mean, yep. great one feeding upon the other on the other, yeah. enriching oh, yeah. each other. Just beautiful. Kudos. Thank, Thank you, Merle. You. That yeah. was so eloquent. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Merle. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I want to just chime in and uh, and ditto Merle. I also felt this progression into an almost trance-like state. I'm still, I'm still trying to ground myself over here. Yes, uh, really, Brenda, you took us to elevations, and I, I did very much enjoy the unfolding, and and the the cross fertilization. You know, you really see it and feel it and hear it and sense it. It's a, it. The whole evening was a very sensual uh, experience, mm -hmm. and um, and. I'm just wondering, Clara, you you were pretty clear about it in your presentation, how you started with the art and then you came to the poetry. And for you, they're they're more distinct. Yeah. Like you're you're working with one or working with the other. And yet when you presented the art with the with the poetry, it um it it felt like one was infusing and infused by the other. I didn't feel the separation. Oh, good. And so I and so I, I was wondering, John and Brenda, you didn't speak to that. At least I didn't hear it. <laughs> There's always a lot of noise in the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> with, with with this kind of cross fertilization, do you find that you work more in one direction? Are you back and forth? Do you start with music and then work to words, or how does it how does it happen for you? Because here I'm seeing another side of the three of you than what we normally see week to week in group where it's just poetry, right? right? Brenda, do you want to go first? Um, well, if I'm making a performance piece, like Split Mask, that mask came out of a dream. Mm -hmm. And it just wouldn't let me alone. I was trying to figure out how to make it, how to make it. And I went into the art store and they had the little um, um, cardboard ones. Mm -hmm. So I realized if I ripped it and cut it and then I layered it with paper mache and I put um, a flannel on the inside so it's soft on the skin. Um, and then once I had the mask, it was like, got to write a poem. I don't want to write a poem. Mm -hmm. You got to write a poem. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And then I, I had a show at Urban Gallery and I needed one large painting um to go in the show and so I actually did the painting for split mask about two days before the show so um I did a lot of it on the floor in my very <laughs> my living room hmm. um and did a lot of gold leaf on it but um so I had the painting and then you know there was a poem so then it became uh, when I uh, they asked me to to make to do some events that would bring people into the gallery, so we did a performance evening, and that's kind of when I started to get to know John. I asked him uh, because I knew you played. Anyway, so you and Luciano and I, and then to make it, 
a performance evening, I danced for everybody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the dance <laughs> so actually came last. And I passed around. Yeah. So that, and then that was the first time. Oh, no, I did Ink Ocean that night. Uh-huh. Right, right. Yeah, they, they it kind of grows like it might. It seems that it comes from the visual for me, Alana, uh-huh. because mm-hmm. this costume took me about a year to figure it out because I knew kind of where I was going. Mm-hmm. And the poem came out after. Yeah. Yes. And how about you, John? Well, you know, I think I've been realizing I've sort of been involved in these three arts and each of them starts from its own impetus. Mm-hmm. Like I'll pick up the guitar and find something I like. It doesn't necessarily connect with a, a poem or the photographs I'm doing, but I keep looking for a way to unify the three. And mm-hmm. I, I've tried writing songs and I think I've written maybe two not bad songs so far, but it doesn't feel uh, like a complete union of what I want with words and music. So I'm still kind of searching for the thing that connects them all. But I think each of them has its own impulse. Like sometimes I feel like going out and taking photographs and uh-huh. I come home and I like some of them. Later on, I'll be diddling around on my guitar or I'll start writing poetry. So it's sort of like I've got three brains that don't always talk to each other, if you don't. Uh-huh. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always find the process interesting. Often when we're when we're in it, we're not metacognitive about it. So That's then right. you have to step out of it and say, oh, this is how it happened. Mm-hmm. You know, I find it interesting, Brenda, when you said that you started with the mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also mm-hmm. the that part of your presentation where you talked about the inside of the mask, mm-hmm. which is the side mm-hmm. that that we're closest to. And mm-hmm. yet it's not the side that the outer world sees. So yeah. there's so much to think about in your piece. It's so rich. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I've it's, seen it before or part of it, but it requires more seeing and attending mm-hmm. to. And uh yeah, John, you might have said that in your in your opening presentation about the importance of attentiveness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm of attending, paying attention. And um, yeah, I think that's probably at the core of it all, whether it's visual or it's auditory or it's performative, however it is, it's it's that attentiveness. So, yeah. So it's great to be in attendance here. (laughs) Even though you can't see me, you don't want to see me. (laughs) No. Well, you're probably all covered in products from your cooking. Right? I, I, oh, yes. And I've got <laughs> an apron on it. Hair. Oh, it's, it, yeah. You don't want to want it. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I'm enjoying um, being here and seeing you and seeing the group. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. That very was a much. wonderful evening. Thank you, Alana. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you, Alana. And how about you, Clara? Well, you don't really connect yeah, your paintings to you. I just have the two. Yeah, I'm kind of in awe with like you guys having more than two things because <laughs> I find uh, the painting and poetry, yeah, just are, yeah. are very demanding as it is. And I don't know if you get this in other arts, but I almost feel kind of guilty if I'm working <laughs> more on one over the other. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I guess that there's a way of striking a right balance because in your presentations too, there was there's a lot of integration going on. So, yeah. I sometimes wonder if I've been deluding myself and would I have been more successful and famous if I just focused on one instead of all three, but I've learned so much from, you know, not Mm -hmm. just being a writer, but also trying photography, trying music. So Mm -hmm. I guess it all, you know, washes out in the end. Well, sometimes you put more pressure on one thing than the other. And if one thing is sort of quote for fun I don't mean to put words in your mouth but like for me if I take pictures it's just for fun but mm-hmm. it's also creative yeah so but but if you're focusing on your writing then then the writing gets so much pressure that it's nice to have something else to do yeah. that you're not necessarily submitting for and trying to get prizes or grants for that's so. a good point yeah true 
Yeah. yeah, I think phot photography would be my kind of fun thing, but that's just taking pictures on my iPhone, like everyone and posting them. That's but you've taken my... such great cat pictures, you know, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are my most popular ones. If you, know? if you write a poem for Blue, you have a whole... Oh, I do. I actually Portfolio have... of uh, yeah. photographs. <laughs> yeah, there's a poem for her that will be, uh, yeah in the future that will be in a collection so or she might appear here and there in a poem that would be probably yeah. more like a cat-like thing I, to do yes. you know <laughs> great well thank you all mm -hmm. thank you for being here and for thank you for being here yeah thanks uh, for being here through the whole thing well, yeah pleasure yeah. Hey, everyone i had a great time Oh, Lisa, Thanks thank you, here, too, Lisa. for being yeah. here through the whole evening. Oh, that was amazing. And, and Clara, oh, my gosh, your talents in the paintings are just amazing. Like, oh, my goodness. Oh, thank yeah, you. The words are just, I love them, love them. Thank yeah, you. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Most of them are sold. Are Some they? of the oh, wow. images are so tiny. When I was you know doing the the video i was like how is this gonna look in a yeah, larger screen the, but it turned out unfortunately okay. the the file was like not the actual painting some are quite large but mm -hmm. the the files itself were small because i had emailed them and i didn't yeah, I, I memory uh, issues uh, and yeah so, because she doesn't have the paintings anymore they're 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 long gone mm -hmm. did um, they take you long to do the paintings they really can take a while, um, like one of the larger ones, uh, over, yeah, over five years working on it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And I do, with some of them, I actually do like about 40 layers of, of like, oh. of glazing. But in that, in one that I really went to town on, I did like 40. You can do, anyhow, and that was just a technique I learned, but I, I tend to work on them quite a long time, um, just doing like layering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so was that quicker, was that but... was that one that you did all that layering? One of the yeah. images we saw. Yeah, that well, that one I actually have because I don't want to sell it. The one with the two owls, the really oh, big one, because I worked on that one for so many years, you know, yeah. and I just I'm very attached to it. So yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. The red painting. one. Um. Yeah, it has a lot of red in the background with the two. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's great. Yeah, that's a striking thing. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. And the mystical, you know, there's something very mystical about your paintings. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, folks, maybe we'll wrap this up now. We've had a great discussion and yes. thank you for all your participation. Yeah. And uh, I will eventually save this and edit part of it and put it on YouTube. So, you know, if you have friends who couldn't see it or you found it so wonderful, you want to revisit it, we'll be there sometime soon. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, Mary.